going to invite Dave Dawson, our, our course chairman, to come back and speak to us again. He's going to talk to us about aneurysms involving the renal and visceral arteries. Dave. We're going to shift from, from something that's uh, uh, new and exciting to something that is a little bit old school, and that's the uh, aneurysm treatment. A lot of the data we have about visceral artery aneurysms are old data, um, and we're trying to put into perspective uh, the, the natural history of, of this, these problems, uh, combining some of the historic data and what we see in the textbooks with what we see now based on um, the, uh, the available imaging studies. I have uh, no uh, conflicts relevant to uh, this presentation. Um, I'll start with a case presentation and, and then talk uh, a little bit about renal artery aneurysms. Uh, splanchnic artery aneurysms, or, or uh, aneurysms of the arteries to the, to the uh, viscera, uh, I'll, I'll uh, talk about as a group and, and focus a little bit about on the uh, most common type of splanchnic artery aneurysm, the splenic artery aneurysm, and uh, talk about treatment considerations. So this is a 53-year-old uh, man who was referred from a rural area. He's a lumber mill worker. He had had a back injury on the job and had uh, some pain and that resulted in an imaging study being performed. And you can see here that in the right upper quadrant, there's the world's biggest gallstone. So he had uh, plain films and a CT scan for the workup. Uh, and what was found is actually a calcified renal artery aneurysm. He had normal renal function. His serum creatinine was one milligram per deciliter. And his blood pressure was in the normal range, 132 over 83. CT scan showed this. Uh, uh, what looks like a rim-enhancing lesion, of course. That's just, uh, that's just a calcification within, within the, uh, the uh, aneurysm wall uh, in the renal artery. Um, it's difficult to look at these with just the axial or the, the orthogonal views. And so to, to better evaluate visceral artery aneurysms, uh, multiplanar reconstructions and thin slices and thicker slabs, um, I think, are very useful. And, and this is a, a thin client uh, uh, version of uh, Terra Recon that can be used on any networked computer uh, to, uh, to further evaluate the, uh, the aneurysm. And you can create a 3D volume rendered uh, version of that and rotate it and look at it from different perspectives. And by doing that, you can tell that this is a densely calcified aneurysm. It's almost uh, a, a spherical. It's a saccular aneurysm. And it's located right where the renal artery trifurcates. So it's not on the main renal artery. It's right at the branch points. Um, the patient uh, prior to referral had been uh, evaluated with a diagnostic arteriogram, um, and the, the CT images that uh, you saw were, were uh, sent with the patient and post-processed uh, uh, in the clinic. Uh, the diagnostic arteriogram that was done prior to the referral um, was not followed with embolization or treatment because of a concern that embolization couldn't be done without occluding the renal artery um, and that uh, a covered stent wouldn't be an option because of the location at the branch point. A uh, duplex scanning was performed, uh, and you can see that the aneurysm measures about 2.8 centimeters uh, by ultrasound and, and by CT. The uh, duplex has the advantage of also giving us physiologic information about flow characteristics in the renal artery adjacent to the aneurysm. Um, th this is a, a selective arteriogram uh, done. You can see the calcified rim on the subtracted images. You can see that the aneurysm uh, arises uh, right at this point where the uh, three main renal artery branches come off. And uh, it was elected to treat this with an embolization technique. Uh, first step was to selectively engage the renal artery, uh, and a hydrophilic wire was advanced past the aneurysm. Uh, that was then exchanged with a catheter uh, for a, a stiffer uh, 35,000 Rosen wire. And with the wire in place, a uh, flexible sheath could be tracked into the renal artery. And so now we've got a six French sheath in place um, I elected to do this with a, a, a buddy wire technique. The 18,000 guide wire went past the renal artery origin so that um, uh, if in the process of embolizing the renal artery aneurysm there was encroachment on the main renal artery, there would be the opportunity to, to stent. Um, uh, this is a uh, microcatheter system uh, engaging into the renal artery. And with the microcatheter uh, in the uh, renal artery aneurysm, um, a framing coil was placed. And this is a, uh, uh, basically a, a 3D spherical construct to build a big ball inside the aneurysm. Uh, this, is a, this is a cage that can then subsequently hold uh, smaller coils. 
So this uh, just shows a little bit about the, this particular system. The system used was an 18 thousandths framing coil. It's a detachable system, so it's on the end of the wire that advances it through the microcatheter, uh, but it forms loops that then uh, orient themselves in three different planes. The device has a, a, a little electrical system that uh, detaches it from the uh, end of the, the deployment system uh, when you're ready to separate it. And then with the uh, framing coils in place, additional coils can be placed. In this situation, a hydrocoil was used, and, and the hydrocoils are a, 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 a coil that includes a, a, a polymer on the outer surface of the coil that swells uh, when it's in the blood to increase the diameter and the bulk associated with that. It provides for additional filling of the space. So with a couple of framing coils in place and a number of hydrocoils placed within it, the aneurysm is fairly densely packed. In follow-up imaging, you can see that there is a, a substantial artifact uh, on the CT associated with the, the metal, and it's a little bit difficult to see uh, whether or not there is or is not flow, but duplex scanning was useful to show that there was no flow within the aneurysm at the uh, hilum of the kidney. Now, renal artery aneurysms are rare. Uh, the angiographic prevalence is uh, uh, less than 1% in the general population, and in those with hypertension, 2.5%. Uh, 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 More commonly, they're found in patients with fibromuscular dysplasia. Aneurysms usually involve the main renal artery and its bifurcation. Calcification of renal artery aneurysms is often apparent, and you can see this on a plain film in patients with renal artery, angi uh, renal artery aneurysms in about uh, a quarter to a half of patients. Most renal artery aneurysms are true aneurysms, and they can be associated with atherosclerotic disease or, or um, uh, the most common degenerative aneurysm um, in, uh, in, in, in visceral segments. But, um, fibromuscular dysplasia, actually fibromuscular dysplasia is the most common associated condition uh, associated with uh, true aneurysms. Um, these involve typically the distal portions of the main renal artery uh, or uh, the uh, point of division. False aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms may be complications of invasive procedures in the kidney, such as a biopsy or nephrostomy. So uh, branch arteries are injured within the parenchyma, and uh, false aneurysms are formed. These have in, in, intraparenchymal location. Aneurysms can also be classified by their morphology as saccular or uh, sac-shaped, fusiform, uh, or a, 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 a uh, football-shaped dilatation. They can be associated with dissection and subsequent dilatation uh, or intrarenal microaneurysms. Uh, symptoms occur only in the minority of patients. The patient that I presented had symptoms of back pain, but he had musculoskeletal back pain, and most patients don't have pain specifically associated with the symptoms. Um, hypertension can occur. Uh, sometimes patients, of course, have underlying uh, essential hypertension. Uh, but if there is compression of a renal artery branch by the aneurysm, that can result in renal vascular hypertension. Or in patients who have microembolization of uh, thrombus, uh, there may be uh, parenchymal damage and hypertension as a result of that. In those patients with embolization, they pr may present with hematuria, uh, or there may be, uh, in rare cases, abdominal pain associated with expansion of the aneurysm uh, or embolization. There can be decline in renal function, or if a patient presents with a, a rupture, acute hemodynamic collapse. Renal artery aneurysm rupture is rare. It's reported in less than 10% of patients with renal artery aneurysms. Um, and it's uh, difficult to know exactly what prompts renal aneurysm, renal artery aneurysm rupture, uh, but it's been associated with an aneurysm size of greater than two centimeters and more common in pregnant women. These are patients with fibromuscular dysplasia. The mortality risk of a renal artery aneurysm rupture is thought to be less than 10%, um, but the mortality in pregnancy is higher, and maternal mortality up to 50%, and uh, fetal mortality in the majority of cases. The indications for treatment, therefore, are symptomatic aneurysms, or those over the uh, two centimeter size uh, threshold, uh, aneurysms that are enlarging on serial imaging, uh, or aneurysms in uh, women who are, are pregnant or anticipate pregnancy. Of course, ruptured aneurysms needed to be treated, and all false aneurysms should be treated, and also aneurysms associated with arteriovenous fistula or dissection, often an iatrogenic complication, should be treated. Uh, the options for treatment include both surgical and endovascular techniques. The, the surgical treatment uh, can be uh, aneurysmorophy or 
a surgical removal of the aneurysm and repair of the artery, either a primary repair or, or more commonly a, a vein patch angioplasty. The distal location of the, the aneurysm in many cases makes that a difficult operation um, without removing the kidney and, and repairing the kidney on the back bench and ex vivo repair. Uh, because of this, in many cases, the treatment, the surgical treatment historically uh, for many patients has been a nephrectomy. Um, there are a variety of endovascular techniques. We'll talk about those a little bit uh, towards the end. Splanchnic artery aneurysms include splenic artery aneurysms, the most common, aneurysms of the hepatic artery or superior mesenteric artery, and less commonly, celiac artery, gastric, and gastroepiploic arteries, uh, aneurysms of the branches of the SMA, the uh, jejunal, ileal, and colic arteries, uh, and also gastroduodenal, pancreaticoduodenal, and pancreatic arteries. Um, one of these, in particular, celiac artery aneurysm, I think we're, we're seeing more frequently now uh, diagnosed as really a post-stenotic dilatation in patients who have uh, proximal compression of the celiac artery. When rupture occurs, it causes uh, uh, intra-abdominal, or either retroperitoneal or intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Patients present with acute abdomen and shock. Uh, it's not uncommon for the patients to have a, a history of some pain and perhaps some symptoms of hypotension with initial stabilization if there's a contained retroperitoneal rupture or splenic artery aneurysm uh, rupturing in the lesser sac and then a secondary uh, collapse. Uh, that secondary collapse can be catastrophic uh, as there's then free rupture. It's difficult to find the source of bleeding uh, with these cases. I've seen very few of these, but the, uh, the, the general findings are you operate on a patient with hemodynamic collapse, there's a large retroperitoneal hematoma, and digging through that is really a very unpleasant thing to do. And so you have to have some kind of imaging to be able to find the source of bleeding, uh, and that can include intraoperative duplex scanning uh, or angiography intraoperatively or immediately postoperatively. The uh, prevalence estimates vary. Um, there is a higher more, uh, reported mortality in the older literature. Uh, so when I looked at a, uh, a copy of uh, Rutherford's textbook of vascular surgery from about two editions prior, it talked about celiac artery aneurysms being occur occurring in, in only 200 patients reported in the literature, and that these were a highly uh, a mortal uh, condition and they should be operated on whenever found. And I've probably seen within the last year, Bill, maybe uh, five or so uh, incidental findings of, of uh, less than two centimeters celiac artery aneurysms on imaging studies. And so that would suggest that they're much more common than the older studies uh, had, had reported. And we don't really see good prevalence estimates in the modern literature, but we know from, from uh, experience that, that they're common findings on imaging studies. Uh, the natural history is uncertain. It depends on which artery is involved, uh, what, what the pathology is. Is this an atherosclerotic or degenerative aneurysm? Is it associated with fibromuscular dysplasia? Uh, is it in a young woman who might be pregnant? Is it in an, uh, a 70 year old person with a calcific uh, aneurysm? What's the morphology, shape, calcification uh, uh, of the of the aneurysm and, and coexistent disease. The uh, distribution of, of these is shown here. The splenic artery uh, re represents about 60% of uh, the uh, uh, splanchnic artery aneurysms, hepatic 20%, uh, superior mesenteric artery about 5%, and celiac just under 5%. These are where most of these splanchnic artery aneurysms occur. A variety of imaging techniques can be used, including duplex, CT, uh, and angiography. Uh, splenic artery aneurysms, as I said, are the most common visceral artery aneurysms, representing 60% or more of the, of the splanchnic or visceral artery aneurysms. Uh, there is a female to male uh, predilection, uh, 4 to 1, and the contributing factors for the development of splenic artery aneurysms include uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, the medial fibrodysplasia type. Uh, it's also been associated with pregnancy and, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, multiparous women, uh, and it's associated with portal hypertension, cirrhosis, um, and that's uh, also a rupture risk. Um, pseudoaneurysms may form in the splenic artery uh, from inflammatory conditions, infection, or pancreatitis, uh, where the splenic artery is adjacent to that retroperitoneal organ. The imaging findings for splenic artery aneurysms, they are often well-defined and homogeneous on a contrast enhanced CT, fairly easy to discern. There is a variable location along the course of the splenic artery. The, the aneurysms, the true aneurysms associated with fibromuscular dysplasia are often found in the more distal course of the vessel, and mural thrombus may be present. The 
the significance that mural thrombus is, is, has not been defined. Peripheral calcification is common, and a signet ring appearance uh, is the typical appearance on plain film, so a round calcific signet ring calcification on the, on the left upper quadrant on a plain film, especially on an older individual, is most likely a splenic artery aneurysm. Indication for treatment of splenic artery aneurysms, well, certainly uh, symptomatic aneurysms. Size is a little bit variable, what's been recommended. Some uh, uh, series have suggested anything over two, others uh, monitoring up to three. Um, but certainly aneurysms less than two centimeters uh, in a, a postmenopausal individual or older person probably can be safely watched. Enlarging aneurysms or those in uh, women who are pregnant or have uh, childbearing potential should be dealt with, of course, those with rupture, false aneurysms. And for patients uh, who have portal hypertension, in particular those who are expected to undergo or may undergo liver transplantation, there should be elective repair as, as liver transplantation has been associated with a risk of rupture. Uh, in pregnancy, most splenic artery aneurysm uh, ruptures occur in the second and third trimester, as I mentioned. Uh, they are more common in women who have had multiple pregnancies. And if they're found during pregnancy, um, uh, repair should be considered uh, because of the significant risk of rupture and the risk of both fetal and mo maternal mortality. Older series suggested that there was a, a, a very common fetal loss and, and uh, greater than 50% maternal mortality. More recent series have, have uh, shown better results. There are a variety of surgical options for treatment of uh, splenic artery aneurysms, either open or laparoscopic procedures. The aneurysms can be excised. Uh, interposition grafting is typically not required uh, as uh, the spleen is often able to remain viable based on the uh, blood supply from the short gastrics. The aneurysms can be uh, ligated or clipped, and this can be done laparoscopically. Or if, if the aneurysm is very distal in the splenic artery, uh, it may be removed uh, in combination with splenectomy. Uh, in general, arterial reconstruction is not indicated, uh, and if there is splenic infarction associated with ligation, uh, it's usually tolerated. It's rare that uh, there is a need for splenectomy uh, for necrosis or abscess of the spleen, um, uh, but it's not uncommon for patients to have a post-embolization or post-ligation syndrome uh, with um, uh, transient pain, uh, fever, and leukocytosis. Endovascular techniques for treatment of visceral artery aneurysms include covered stents. They're both balloon expandable and self-expanding uh, covered stents that can be used uh, for treatment of visceral artery aneurysms. Uh, I gave an, a case presentation uh, at the beginning that showed an example of embolization. Uh, and embolization can be done with arterial occlusion, so a splenic artery aneurysm can be treated with occlusion of the splenic artery, uh, but in the case of the renal artery aneurysm, uh, aneurysm uh, embolization with the uh, maintenance of patency of the vessel. The embolization can use coils, detachable coils, uh, plugs, uh, or a stent-assisted coil embolization where a stent is placed to maintain patency of the vessel and um, the interstices are catheterized and, and then the aneurysm is embolized. So to summarize, uh, for visceral artery aneurysms, uh, splanchnic artery aneurysms, splenic arteries are the most common location for these um, and most are benign incidental findings, uh, but not in pregnant women. Uh, small atherosclerotic or degenerative aneurysms less than two centimeters are often monitored as there is a risk associated with doing something to treat them. And these small aneurysms seem to be associated with a very low risk of, of rupture. Uh, but pseudoaneurysms occurring in the splenic, hepatic, or mesenteric arteries um, uh, should be treated primarily um, because of the, the different natural history of these uh, uh, aneurysms often associated with an inflammatory or infectious process. Thank you very much.